But before we get into today's video, we're just going to take a few moments to talk about our wonderful sponsor, Magellan TV. Magellan TV has a great selection of true crime documentaries, and new ones are always being added. One that was recently added, and I thought was excellent, but haunting, is called The Family Who Vanished. In February 2003, a man named Neil Chowen went to Stonehenge for what he thought was a business meeting. Sadly, he never returned home. Two days later, his wife, his two young sons, and his mother vanished. The documentary is a horrifying examination of the greed and callousness that fills some people's souls. Magellan TV also has some riveting history documentaries. The other day I saw an amazing one called World War I's First Frontline Cameraman. It's the amazing story of cameraman Jeffrey Herbert Mallins who made a controversial documentary for footage shot at the Battle of Somme. When it was released in 1916, it was seen by 20 million people. World War I's First Frontline Cameraman is a fascinating documentary about the horrors of war that every history buff should watch. Magellan TV has been a great, long-time sponsor, and to be honest with you, right now is the best time to sign up. That's because Magellan TV has an amazing, exclusive offer for criminally listed viewers. You can get 30% off an annual membership, which means you get access to over 3,000 documentaries for just $3.50 a month. Just go to try.magellantv.com slash criminally listed to claim your discounted annual membership today. If you have already been watching with me and you let your subscription lapse, you can still claim this offer. Find something great to watch on Magellan TV and you'll be supporting criminally listed in the process. Number 3. Richard Bouillon Ile St. John is a small, diamond-shaped island in the Thousand Island River in Quebec, Canada. The island is about 18 miles north of downtown Montreal. The island is a little less than a half a mile wide and less than half a mile long. In the fall of 1999, it was home to 16-year-old Julie Supranna and her father. Julie had three siblings and seven nieces and nephews. On the night of November 16, 1999, Julie took the city bus. At 9.55 p.m., she got off the bus at a stop that was about 65 yards from the apartment she shared with her father. Sadly, Julie never made it home. A massive search was conducted. Twelve dogs were used and 200 volunteers came out to look for the 16-year-old. But not a single clue to Julie's whereabouts was found. The police talked to some passengers who were on the bus and the bus driver. The bus driver said that a man was waiting at the bus stop when Julie got off and he asked the man if he wanted to board. The man made a motion saying that he didn't. The bus driver said it was a white man who was wearing dark, baggy clothes. A passenger was hypnotized and he said that the man was about 5'7 and he had dark eyes. He was wearing baggy, light colored pants and a dark jacket that had a hood. He was wearing a hat that may have had a New York Yankees logo on it. He was also wearing a bandana on the bottom part of his face. He may have had a scar over one of his eyes. The witness also saw a second man near the bus shelter. He was wearing a white hat and a dark coat with a white Nike swoosh on the back of it. Another witness, who wasn't on the bus but was in the area, said that he saw a young woman with dark curly hair talking to two men beside a car. The car was beige and it was possibly a Honda Civic or a Ford Tempo. The police believe that these two men were the same men the bus passenger saw. The police wanted to talk to the men but they couldn't find them. Eventually, the police developed a suspect. It was a 45-year-old man named Richard Bouillon. He lived in the apartment above Julie and her father. Bouillon had a criminal record that involved sex crimes. 
1990, he was sentenced to two years in prison after he raped a teenage girl in the hospital when he posed as a doctor. In March 2001, about a year and a half after Julie's disappearance, Richard Bouillon was arrested. But he was not arrested in connection with Julie's disappearance. Instead, he was arrested on 16 counts of rape. He had been accused of raping his girlfriend's daughter between 1973 and 1989. The girl was 5 when the abuse started and 16 when it ended. She said that Bouillon would drug her so she couldn't fight back. The abuse only came to an end when he was arrested for raping the teenage girl in the hospital. Two other women came forward and said that Bouillon had also drugged and sexually abused them as children. Bouillon went to trial in November 2001. A psychiatrist revealed that Bouillon had boasted about his sex crimes. Bouillon had claimed he had raped 15 women by the time he was 15 years old. He said that by the time he was 20, he had sexually assaulted 30 more women. The police thought that these numbers were inflated. But they still found a disturbing number of victims. They thought he had sexually assaulted 15 girls and women. A psychiatrist said that Bouillon was a remorseless psychopath, a manipulator, and a narcissist obsessed with sex. Bouillon had learned nothing from his decades of treatment. Richard Bouillon was convicted on all counts. The prosecution wanted him labeled as a dangerous offender so he'd be sentenced to life without the chance of parole. Instead, he was sentenced to just six years and five months of prison with ten years of probation. His victims were outraged and they said he would go back to sexually assaulting women as soon as he was released. But it turned out that he would never get that opportunity. While in prison, Bouillon was diagnosed with cancer. In June 2006, he was dying in a hospital. The police visited him several times in the hospital and they asked him several times what happened to Julie. But he maintained they had nothing to do with his 16 year old's disappearance. But Bouillon wasn't forthcoming with the police, he was with two healthcare workers. He apparently looked into the eyes of the coroner, Catherine Rudel Tressier, and said, I killed her. Rudel Tressier asked him who he killed, and he said, Julie. Over three days, Bouillon told an auxiliary nurse, Anique Prudhomme, about the murder. He said he had sexually assaulted her and strangled her. On day three, he told her that he put her body in a gym bag and put bricks into the gym bag. He then dumped the bag in the river that surrounded the island. He said that the body went into the water across from a church. On June 22, 2006, 52-year-old Richard Bouillon died from cancer. Catherine Rudel Tessier and Anique Prudhomme, the two healthcare workers whom Bouillon made the deathbed confessions to, talked with each other after he died. Prudhomme said that Bouillon planned on confessing to a popular crime reporter. Prudhomme assumed that he had before he died. So they didn't feel the need to tell their supervisors, let alone the police, about Bouillon's deathbed confessions. Nearly five years went by, and then, in January 2011, Anique Prudhomme was watching the news. She saw a report about Julie's murder from the crime reporter that Bouillon wanted to confess to. The reporter said that Julie's murder was still unsolved. So she realized that Bouillon had not contacted him before he died. She called the reporter's hip line and told him about Bouillon's deathbed confessions. 
Prudhomme then told the story about the deathbed confessions live on air. The police were upset that she didn't tell them right away about the deathbed confessions. They said they would have had her wear a wire or they would have put a mic in the room had they known he was confessing. In September 2011, 12 years after the disappearance, the police searched the river where Bouillon said he dumped Julie's body. But no trace of Julie was found. Nevertheless, that year, Julie Supernau was pronounced dead. In October 2012, nearly 13 years after Julie's disappearance, the coroner released a report. The report said that she was most likely killed by Richard Bouillon and her body was dumped into the river. Tragically, no trace of Julie Supernau has ever been found. Number 2. Emma Stillwell In November 1882, a 30-year-old woman named Emma Stillwell arrived at the home of her father-in-law in Waterford, Connecticut. Emma had her nine-month-old child with her. Emma was deathly ill with consumption. A few weeks later, she still wasn't better, so her husband, Jay Stillwell, was called for. Jay was a freight conductor and he lived with Emma and their child in Ottumwa, Iowa. Jay arrived at his father's home on December 7, 1882. Four days later, Emma told her husband that she had some horrible things to get off her chest before she died. Emma explained that she first got married when she was 15 years old to a man named Benjamin Swigart. They lived in Maryville, Missouri. Emma had two children who were now eight and six years old. Benjamin was a shoemaker who accumulated a lot of wealth. He owned two houses in eight lots. Benjamin was an alcoholic who often came home drunk. Emma said that she and her brother, Chester Hoard, and her mother, Susan Snyder, decided to kill Benjamin. On March 3, 1987, Benjamin came home and he was drunk. Chester threw Benjamin face down on the floor. Emma said that she struck her husband on the back of the head with a shoemaker's hammer. Then they put him into bed. Emma said that she took her two kids over to her neighbor's home and spent the night. The next day, Benjamin's body was discovered. Emma, Chester, and their mother were all arrested. But they were released after the coroner's jury determined that Benjamin had died after he choked to death on his own vomit because he was intoxicated. Unfortunately, this was just the start of Emma's deathbed confession. Emma said that she, her mother, and her brother continued to live in Benjamin's house and they took on boarders. They learned that one of the boarders had money. So they got into his room and beat him to death with a hammer. But they learned that he didn't have much money on him. They dumped his body in a ravine outside of the town. The body was found a year later and by that time it was horribly decomposed. The body was never identified and Emma said she didn't know who he was. Emma then got to the part of her life that her husband knew about. They got married in January 1878 and settled in Rulo, Nebraska. Around their first anniversary, Emma gave birth to a daughter named Gertie. On May 11, 1880, Gertie was 14 months old. Emma said that she didn't like Gertie because she was puny and sickly. Emma claimed their mother made a tea from steep peach leaves. They had Gertie drink the tea. After that, Emma said she strangled 14-month-old Gertie to death. Jay was at work at the time, and when he got home, he was told that Gertie had died a natural death. 
In March 1881, Emma and Jay moved to Ottumwa, Iowa. Shortly after that, Emma's mother, Susan Snyder, was traveling to visit them and she was involved in a railroad accident. Susan died four months later. Emma gave birth to another child in early 1882. If what Emma said wasn't shocking enough, she then told her husband that she had tried to kill him three different times to get his insurance money. After hearing the confessions to the three murders and his own attempted murder, Jay Stilwell didn't tell anyone about them for several days. Then he got the minister, the justice of the peace, and two other respected members of the community. Emma confessed to them as well and signed the confession. On January 2nd, 1883, the town's physician, who was also the minister, spent the day with Emma. She told him that she had committed other horrible crimes that she would never confess to. The minister slash doctor convinced her to unburden her soul. So Emma did. She said that after her mother's accident, she nursed her for several months. But then she became tired of taking care of her mother, so she killed her as well. She strangled her to death while her husband was out of the house. The minister slash doctor asked what disease her father had died from. Emma started sobbing and then blurted out that he had died of a slit throat. Emma's father, Chester Hort Sr., disappeared in 1852, the same year that Emma was born. The family told people that Chester Sr. went to California and he was killed during a gold mine dispute. Emma never explained who slit his throat or how she knew he died of a slit throat. After Emma confessed, her brother, Chester, was confronted. He denied having anything to do with the murders. Several doctors examined Emma, and while she was physically ill, they thought she was mentally sound. So they had no reason to doubt her deathbed confessions. The deathbed confessions made headlines throughout the country. This prompted several people to get in touch with the police. This included a Catholic priest who claimed he was with Charles Hort Sr. when he died and he said that he did not die of a slit throat. Another person who contacted the police was a member of the coroner's jury who ruled on Benjamin Swigart's death. They said that Benjamin's body showed no signs of trauma and they had ruled he had drowned on his own vomit. Emma Stilwell died on January 16, 1883, at the age of 30. To many people, it's unclear if she murdered the four people she confessed to killing. Since there was so much confusion and a lack of evidence, Emma's brother, Charles Hort Jr., was never charged with any crimes in connection with the deathbed confessions. Number 1. Leo Sylvester Hannon In August 1942, 62-year-old Annie Smith and her 74-year-old sister, Rosalind Smith, lived in the Salvation Army headquarters in Wairoa, New Zealand. Wairoa is a town on New Zealand's Northern Ireland. Annie was a brigadier with the Salvation Army. For 25 years, she did missionary work in Japan. She had only come back to her native New Zealand two years earlier. On August 21st, 1942, a neighbor of the sisters made a horrifying discovery. They found Annie dead in a chair in the headquarters. It was clear she had died from severe head injuries. Also, she had been dead for quite some time. In a bedroom was the dead body of Rosalind Smith. Like her sister, she had died from terrible head injuries. The medical examiner believed that Annie had been killed with an axe 
while Rosalind was killed with an axe and a fire poker. The medical examiner thought that the sisters were killed nearly two weeks earlier, on August 8th. After they were killed, but before their bodies were found, at least two people entered the Salvation Army headquarters. One was a woman who came in through the kitchen and went to the hall to pray. After praying, she left. She didn't see either body. The other person was an eight-year-old girl. She got into the headquarters while she was playing with some friends. She threw some pillows at the window and they threw them back to her. She saw Annie's body, but she didn't tell anyone because she was too scared. The police noted that the women's pants were pulled down, but there were no signs of sexual assault. Also, nothing appeared to have been stolen. Money was found in the possession of both women, so the police were at a loss to the motive. The police investigated the double homicide, but no suspects were arrested. It wasn't long before the case went cold. About six years later, there was another axe murder in Wairoa. In December 1948, 69-year-old William Henry Brunton lived alone in a hut near the railway station in Wairoa. Brunton was a retired railway guard. On December 18, 1948, a neighbor found his dead body propped up against his bed. He had been struck at least six times in the head with an axe. The police were baffled by the murder. It appeared that nothing had been stolen. Also, Brunton was a quiet man who kept to himself. He did not have any enemies, so the police had no idea who killed him. The police found a bloody fingerprint on the back door of his hut. They collected fingerprints from 5,000 people, but they never found a match. For decades, both cases sat cold. Then, over 33 years later, in 1982, a lawyer and author named George Israel Joseph published a book about unsolved crimes in New Zealand entitled, By Person or Persons Unknown. In the book, Joseph wrote about visiting a convicted murderer in July 1962. He did not reveal the identity of the man, only calling him X. Joseph had defended X when he was convicted of murder. When Joseph visited X in prison, X was dying of cancer. X told Joseph that he had done some horrible things in his life that the police weren't aware of. He then admitted to killing the Smith sisters in the Salvation Army headquarters. X said that he was working on a farm about 20 miles away from the Salvation Army headquarters. On Saturdays, he would go drinking at a pub. He said that Annie would come into the pub and tell them that they were going to hell and that they should quit drinking. X said that they would all laugh at her whenever she came in. X then explained that one of the men he drank with said that Annie and her sister had a lot of money. X decided to see if that was true and he went over to the Salvation Army headquarters. He ended up killing the two women, but he didn't find any money. Joseph asked X why he pulled the pants down. He explained that he wanted to make it look like a sex crime. X had a criminal record, but it wasn't for sex crimes. He thought that by making it look like a sex crime, it would completely throw suspicion away from him. Then Joseph asked X if he killed Herbert William Brunton as well. X admitted he did. He thought that Brunton might have had money, but he didn't. The only thing he ended up stealing was a half-empty bottle of gin. Sometime after Joseph's book was published, 
a police officer named Sherwood Young read the book. He then contacted Joseph and asked for the identity of X. Joseph said it was a man named Leo Sylvester Hannon. Hannon was born in October 1900 in Wellington, New Zealand. As an adult, Hannon worked as a laborer and bushman. In 1926, he was in prison on unspecified charges and he managed to escape. But he was caught a short time later. In 1931, he was arrested for breaking and entering and he was sentenced to 18 months of hard labor. In 1940, Hannon was arrested on six counts of breaking and entering. He went to trial the following year and he was convicted. In February 1941, he was sentenced to 18 months of hard labor. In August 1942, he murdered the Smith sisters. Six years later, he killed Herbert William Brunton. Two years after that, on August 10, 1950, Frederick Andrew Stade, a 54-year-old night watchman at the railway station in Wellington, was murdered at the station. He had been beaten to death with an iron pipe. Minutes before Stade's body was found, he was seen arguing with a man. The man wanted to use the staff washroom and Stade would not allow him to use the facilities. Several people gave a description of the man. About three hours later, the police came across 50-year-old Leo Sylvester Hannon, who looked a lot like the description of the man. He had blood splattered on his face, his left hand, and his shoes. He also had a small piece of human flesh on the right cuff of his pants. In November 1950, Hannon was convicted of murdering Stade. He was sentenced to life in prison. In 1955, Hannon was working in a prison quarry. He managed to slip away without anyone noticing. He was recaptured a short time later. Hannon died in prison of cancer in October 1962 at the age of 62. Of course, that wasn't before he confessed on his deathbed to murdering the Smith sisters and Herbert William Brunton. After Sherwood Young learned that Hannon was ex in George Israel Joseph's book, he looked at Hannon's record. He learned that Hannon was not in prison or doing hard labor when the murders were committed. So he is confident that Hannon was telling the truth on his deathbed. George Israel Joseph died in 1989. Young did not reveal the identity of Axe until 2000 when he wrote a biographical article on Annie Smith. With four murders committed between 1942 and 1950, Leo Sylvester Hannon is considered New Zealand's first serial killer. Thank you so much for watching today's video. Don't forget to check out our podcast, Into the Killing. It can be found on Stitcher, Deezer, iHeartRadio, or anywhere you find great podcasts. Thank you again for watching.